Good morning, guys. Hey, guys. I got to throw out my hey, guys, right? It's uh, Easter morning when I'm recording this. I'm uh, sitting by the fire over here. It's actually a chilly Easter Sunday. Hope you guys are doing well. I got my continuing with my coffee, second round, our Great Homes ATL mugs here. This is one of the benefits when you become a Great Homes ATL family member. They're really cool, right? And our color schemes and all that. So um, I've spent the morning so far recording about uh, the myth about credit repair and what my thoughts about that are just about credit. So I think we resolved, you know, resolved those. You guys can look back at those videos. Um, I'm going to keep reiterating this so you guys know where to find it. If you download the IGTV app, um, of course, follow us on Great Homes ATL. And then there's a button about halfway down on the left-hand side that will say series. So you can look up Cocktails with Kurt, Mark's updates, Mark's home tours. If you've Enjoy my home tours. Um, I, lo I always upload them to IGTV so you could watch them at any time. If you see something you like, definitely reach out and um, we'll start that process to, you know, to help get you that house if it's still available. <clears throat> but in this topic, I want to talk about closing costs. Um, we've talked about it before, but I don't, we still get a lot of questions about it. Um, you know, people seem to get the concept of down payment. Um, and it's very understandable. They just, these are terms that they hear, you know, oh, I could get an FHA for three and a half percent down. I could get conventional for 3% down. I watched Mark's video. So I now have an understanding about credit. I understand about, um, you know, how to show my income. I did a video on that W2 and 1099. Um, but I really don't understand. I keep hearing this term closing costs. What exactly is that and how much is that going to cost me? All right, so let's just define what closing costs are. Closing costs include attorney fees, your lender fees, government, you know, filing fees, and finally what's called prepaids. <clears throat> and you'll say, Mark, what are prepaids? I'm glad you asked. Prepaids are basically, um, anytime you own a piece of property, you're buying it in a city, a town, a, a county, a municipality. And for owning a piece of land and a structure, whether it be a townhouse, condo, or single family home, they, in order to run government, to pay the mayor, to pay the city government, the sanitation workers, paving your roads, all that kind of stuff. To live in that county, you're paying what's called property taxes. Now in Georgia, property taxes, depending on a the county, they could be as low in like counties like Cherokee County, like as low as 1%. And um, I've seen them go up to maybe like that 1.4, 1.5% if you're paying like in a, you know, a Sandy Springs or a city of Atlanta because you're paying the city taxes and the county taxes. So that's about one to one and a half percent of your appraised value what the, the, the city, the county appraises your property at. And they have something what's called a military. And you can look at these on all the county websites. You go to Rockdale County, Fulton County, Cobb County, Cherokee County, whatever the case may be. And your lender is going to look at that and they're going to formulate on a monthly basis, what would what do you owe for property taxes? Because a property tax bill comes out around April or May, sometimes in June, different counties, and then they're owed every about uh, beginning to mid October in most counties. So the mortgage lender, in addition to your principal, your interest, maybe your private mortgage insurance, are going to have two more things to collect to be a part of your mortgage payment. That's your property taxes, which we're talking about right now, and then your homeowner's insurance. So say you have maybe a $350,000 house, right? And your property taxes are $4,500. They're going to basically take $4,500, divide it by 12 months, and that's what they're going to collect as part of your mortgage payment. Now, when you buy a house, you they have to set up what's called an escrow account. And that is for your property taxes and your homeowner's insurance. So they are going to say, depending on what time of the year um, it is, 
they're going to have to establish it because they're going to have to pay out of that account every month. So typically, they're going to collect anywhere from four, eight, or 12 months, depending on the time of year, what the rules are for that particular lender. They have to establish, basically fund a um, an escrow account for you. Because what happens is every year your property is going to be reevaluated, reappraised by the county to say, hey, this, this uh, $350,000 house, well, the market is doing well, um, now is worth 360000 in year two. And the next year it's 361000 It's slowed down a little bit. Next year it's three seventy. dollars We've seen a lot of economic development going on in your area and the value of your house has gone up, which means that that property tax bill is going to go up every year. So they're going to adjust every year um, what they're collecting. It doesn't typically go up dramatically. The most dramatic ones you would probably see is if you lived in a really bad area and a couple years later, all of a sudden, like in Atlanta, the Beltline has become a big thing. You know, back in the day, if you lived in like an old fourth ward, uh, 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 West Atlanta, West side of Atlanta, the West End, you know, five years ago, you know, when property values were kind of you know, it wasn't a great area. They were suppressed. The property values were suppressed. Now they, you know, included this this belt line that's, in, you know, wrapping around the, the city, kind of like a perimeter. People go for bike rides and jogs, and then people are building, um, you know, bars and restaurants and, and townhouses and stuff on this belt line to give that work, live, play type of uh, vibe. Of course, that house that was, you know, valued at maybe one hundred fifty thousand five years ago is now worth three hundred thousand. Yeah, your property taxes pretty much would have doubled in that situation. But for the most people living in the suburbs or already established areas, you're going to see your property taxes either remain the same or gradually, you know, maybe another ten or you know fifteen dollars in your monthly payment. So they have to establish that escrow account to collect that money up front. Again, four months, eight months, 12 months. Then you have what's called homeowner's insurance. That's to protect your asset, you know, and the bank's asset because you're borrowing from a bank. So God forbid a hurricane, tornado, fire, your house gets hit by lightning. God forbid. I mean, natural occurrences happen. Um, you know, a flood, you know, all that kind of stuff. You have to have insurance on it for the bank to protect that asset. They're going to probably most likely collect one full year, you know, if it's say a thousand dollars to cover it for the year, they're going to cut, that's going to be owed at closing. So that's going to be part of your closing cost. So property taxes, homeowners insurance, you can kind of already start doing the math. You're going to look at what you're going to get multiple quotes for your homeowner's insurance to see what the best rate you can get. And that could fluctuate to year by year. It could stay the same, could go up. If you filed a claim, it's probably going to go up. Um, and then your property taxes, like I said, could go up or down. So if they're collecting eight months or 12 months worth of property taxes, 12 months worth of homeowner's um, uh, insurance up front, there's going to be a lump sum of money that is owed at the closing table in addition to your down payment, that three or three and a half percent, five percent, ten percent, whatever you're putting down. In addition to that, you have, um, because there's a lender that is processing your loan, they're going to have what's called origination fees. It's typically anywhere from a half a percent to one percent to two percent of the loan amount. That's for somebody that is actually giving you the money. So there's Again, a way to make money off of you, which is not a bad thing. You know, if, if they didn't do that, there would be a gluttony of um, empty houses or people that couldn't afford houses, right? So it's a trade-off. You know, I want to get in a house. I need a mortgage for it. They're going to charge you fees for that. There's people that work on your file called underwriters. There's going to be an underwriter fee that's going to be like looking at your whole financial portfolio. There's going to be, um, you have to close in, a, in, in an attorney's office or um, sometimes attorneys will come to your, it, de it depends on the setup. Right now, we're seeing remote closings where you have power of attorneys um, doing closings as well with this virus going on as they're trying to keep people out of the office. But whether you go into the office or not, you're going to have to have an attorney 
um, putting together those documents. They're going to be facilitating. They don't re represent the buyer. They don't represent the seller. They represent the lender. And there's a fee for that, right? For somebody that has passed the bar that this is what they specialize in. They're doing the paperwork. They're sending out documents to everybody. There's a fee for that. That might be 500 that might be 750 that might be a thousand dollars per you know closing so you have those fees and then you have um just like municipality court fees you have to file your deed you might have to file the title you might have to um, send documents to the courthouse stuff like that so there's $15 fees $50 fees all kinds of fees involved in that so you put those together your attorney fees, your lender fees, um, your prepaid fees. In general, they're probably going to range between 3 and 4% of your sales price. So again, you'll just do the math. You're looking at a $350,000 house, 3 or 3.5% 3 down. Let's just take the worst case scenario. Always take the worst case scenario, 4%. So in total, between 3.5% and 4%, you really need about seven and a half percent to close on that three hundred fifty thousand dollar house. Now, the final thing, and what you probably have heard of, well, I've read or I've heard, or my cousin closed on a house, and they got closing costs from the seller. You should always go into it with your worst case scenario because in a hot market, or and even you know, what people think, oh, with this virus going on, it's going to affect. Um, real estate. It could potentially in pockets, but I could tell you guys, we're still closing on houses. If you've done everything you're supposed to, interest rates are super low relatively to history. Um, people need and are relocating and still buying houses. You should always be prepared that the seller doesn't contribute to your closing costs. Where we come in as the experts and as your broker and as your agents is it all depends on the scenario. So what happens is on uh, new home communities, which we've sold uh, probably about a good 80% of our sales this year have been people that have either bought a standing inventory home or purchased um, in a community and picked a floor plan and, and built their home is um, in most cases, if you go with uh, the builder's preferred lender, they will contribute sometimes 2500 sometimes 5000 sometimes 10000 towards your closing costs. So that is going to bring down um, your closing costs from that when you, if in the worst case, a 4%, that might bring it down to, I don't owe anything or I owe, might owe half of it or I might own, uh, owe 75% of it. That's when you use a builder's preferred lender. If it's a resale home, it really just depends. I've run into situations where if it's a well-maintained property, it's a good property, um, you get into bring us your big, your highest and best offer. And in that scenario, if you really, really want the house, you have one buyer that is willing to buy it for full price and not ask for any closing costs. Another buyer willing to pay full price but needs 5000 in closing costs. The seller is going to go with the one where they're going to get the most money out of the least money they have to take out of their profits and go with the person that does not need any closing costs and has um, already been approved. So there will be scenarios where we just need to know when you go through your pre-approval process how much money you do have. Because um, if you are, hey, I ha you know, it's going to cost $20,000 cash to close between your down payment and closing costs to, um, to buy this house and you have only saved up $15,000. We need to know that so that we're only, we, it might take us longer because we might continuously miss out on the house until you find a seller willing to give you that $5,000 that you're short because you've only saved up 15,000 and you need um, 20,000. So that's closing costs for you guys. Hopefully that kind of breaks it down. Worst case scenario, think about 4%, knowing that you potentially could get some back from a seller or a builder when you use their preferred lender. And of course, we've got lenders for you to kind of walk you through this. Um, you're going to want to know your final cash to close, which is a combination of your down payment and closing costs. So hopefully that, guys, that um, helps you understand closing costs when you heard hear that term. So look back at this video. Hopefully how I broke it down really helps you. And we'll go on to a next, the next topic. And I hope you guys are enjoying it and staying safe. All right. Talk to you soon.